Well, welcome and thanks for joining us. We are going to be diving into the Delphi murders. Who killed Abby and Libby and could they strike again? Uh, you really, our viewers, you're part of this expert panel and I'll get to that in just a moment, but let's introduce the experts. Uh, you know them, they're my friends. They are my colleagues, Barbara McDonald and Drew Iden. They are the hosts of the wildly successful podcast, Down the Hill, The Delphi Murders. And of course, they were front and center for our two-part HLN documentary by the same name. Also with us, Casey Jordan. She knows this case inside and out as well. She was featured in the documentary and brings these titles. She's an attorney, a criminologist, and a behavioral analyst. And I mentioned you, the viewer, you have interest in this. You're going to help drive this. So after our two-part documentary, so many of you by the hundreds brought comments and questions. And one of our fearless leaders, another who's passionate about this, Brian Bell, went over all those comments and questions. We picked out some really good ones of similar themes. They're really the, the pressing, pressing issues that uh, you guys have is you're passionate and you want justice for Abby and Libby as do we. So uh, let's dive into it. And uh, I'll start with Barb and Drew uh, first off. And then just to peel back the curtain uh, before we get started, when we were all together in a building, we had what was called the Delphi Bureau. So we were all working in our offices and Barb and Drew were stowed away in this darkened room, pouring over the case, the podcasts. Um, well done, you guys. It, it just you. goes to show when you roll up your sleeves and get passionate about a case, you'll dive in. And I know you're going to be front and center when that suspect is caught and arrested and arrested and, and justice is served. But I'm going to start with you two in case you, you, you as well. Here we are four years later, Barb, no arrest. Are you surprised? I'm a little surprised. After the New Direction press conference in April of 2019, I really thought they were close. I thought there was a lot of momentum and I thought an arrest would come soon. The further away we get from that date, the less confident I am. I think an arrest will come. Um, I'm not confident it's gonna be fast enough for the people watching the case. Yeah. Drew, surprise. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with Barb. I mean, you know, and, and this is what's so maddening about this case is, you know, you've got an image, you've got video, you've got audio. And I think the general consensus, you know, when this case kind of first hit everybody's radar screen, it was like, well, yeah, I mean, considering the technology we have today, this would lead to an arrest in the, you know, near future. Well, I don't think anybody thought the near future was going to be four years. So, uh, yeah, I, um, you know, as far as, are they close? Um, I think that, you know, it's hard to tell. I mean, the, the, the messaging is just kind of, it's kind of blurry. So, uh, but yeah, I think, I think I was under the impression this thing would be solved long ago. Yeah. And Casey Drew just hit it from the outside. You're thinking you've got audio, a picture, Delphi, small community. Are you surprised we don't have an arrest? I am. And, you know, I think it was about, it was two years ago that we all convened, you know, in Atlanta to have a special and make sure that this case was still really in the forefront of the news. Uh, we, they, they had that big presser. We thought they had something breaking, that they had a suspect. Everyone got super excited. And then it was just like crickets. So I'm surprised that two years later, we are still having this conversation, but I'm very happy about that because I absolutely believe that the only way there's going to be an arrest is if somebody out there lends some new information a thought pings into their head. I think the police have done as much with the evidence they have, but we don't have any indication from them that there is nothing, there's nothing new under the sun in the last year or two. Yeah. So I'm really glad that we're still talking about it. I think that's the really, the big silver lining. Yeah, and we will continue to do so. And I'll guarantee you, Barb and Drew will be front and center once something breaks uh, in this case. So let's get to it, you guys. Again, comments and questions from our viewers. Here we go. Number one, why don't we have an approximate height or weight of the suspect? We don't have a clear description of his clothing or hat. Barb, what do we have on that? Clarify. We do. We do have a, a range of height, five, six to five, 10, 180 to 220 pounds, reddish brown hair, Caucasian male. Um, after that, it gets real messy. We know he was wearing a blue jacket and blue jeans, but Nobody knows for sure what's on his head. Is that a hood from the hoodie he might be wearing? Is it a hat he's wearing? Is it something else? We just don't know. Yeah. Casey, would you look at when you hear that description? Is that a treasure trove? I think the reason they're keeping it very broad and very vague is so that we don't get pigeonholed or tunnel visioned on a particular height or weight or age. They're trying to keep the, the, the basket of possible suspects and the description of them 
as open as possible. Let's remind everyone, they, we have, as far as we know, no living witnesses of what this man looked like at that exact moment. We have that screenshot from the video and the police know as much as we do. It is as grainy to them as it is to us. And they're afraid if they start to limit it and say, it's definitely a British cap, we might rule out somebody who has puffy hair that's cut short on the sides. Or if they say, okay, it's definitely a brown hoodie, we'll rule out that it could be you know, something else. So they're trying to keep it really open, but I would argue that the very best way that we can try to figure out the identity of that person is to continue studying the images that we have over and over and over again. Um, nailing it down to a particular age, height, weight, clothing is just going to miss possible suspects. Yeah, even the gate, you know, as we had that, that next piece of video that was released, it was a gate, a walk. Really, that's telling it as far as a mannerism uh, goes. Guys, let's get to number two here. It says, uh, one of our viewers is asking, does the case need a fresh set of eyes from investigators should an outside team be brought in? Drew, what about that? Aren't outside sources helping now? Well, you know, when you when you talk to to the folks that are working on this case, they've said to us a number of times, like, you know, we ask other people in our in our agency for for assistance. Hey, you look at the file. Tell me if there's something I've missed. You know, I think that these law enforcement agencies and many law enforcement agencies across the country will tell you, like, no, nobody's too proud to ask for help. And so I think the, the way they characterize it is like, look, we will take the file to someone else in the sheriff's department or someone else with Indiana State Police and say, hey, give this a look. Can you tell me if there's anything I'm missing? And the other thing is that Doug Carter, the superintendent of the state police says, look, we go through all of these leads. We go all the way to the very end, to the very last one. And when it's time to go back to the beginning, we go back to the beginning. So um, whether it needs fresh eyes, you know, I think that's, you know, for the law enforcement to, to answer, but I think that there are other people that are helping kind of cross-reference this, this case file. Barbara, I see you nodding your head. So it's Carroll County Sheriff's, Indiana State Police. What's the FBI's involvement? Let's start there. The FBI has been involved from the very beginning. We know that they offered up every resource that they have available and from what we understand, every test, every resource that this investigation has needed from the FBI has been given to them. Um, like Drew, you know, my understanding is that they do bring in fresh sets of eyes, investigators. I know they've presented it to uh, the FBI in Quantico, to a class of agents. Um, so they are doing a lot, but I think also, and Casey can talk more about this, that might sort of indicate that this is a, a random crime, that these victims were not uh, known to this perpetrator uh, because he's been able to show up, commit the crime and leave. And we still don't know who he is, despite the video evidence. Yeah. Casey, what, what about a fresh set of eyes? I mean, is it always helpful or can you have too many cooks in the kitchen and it gets a little messy? Well, it can be. I'm going to argue that, you know, you, you make that decision on an ongoing basis, depending on how the case is progressing. And now that four years have passed, I can't believe that it would hurt. I think it would absolutely help. And sometimes what you have to do is get out of the law enforcement eyes and bring in other people. I've been asked uh, for several cold cases to join in um, very confidentially on cold cases to give the criminologist perspective, the behavioral perspective. If we don't have anything from, from DNA, from uh, the, the, the audio, the video, which is so rare that we have that. If we've hit a brick wall with that, then you really do need to bring in people who've worked similar cases from a behavioral standpoint instead of an evidentiary standpoint and basically say, okay, where might this guy be, have gone? Would he still be leaving in the area? Have we looked at all the probation, the parole roles to see if anybody fits this and, and just keep it going. Uh, you'd be shocked how many of these cases are solved because somebody does remember something even four or five years later and calls it into police. But you have to know which buttons to push to get that new information to get people thinking. And honestly, keeping the media is our best hope. Barb, isn't that happening? So those kind of that kind of cross referencing and things like that that Casey's talking about. From what we've been told, uh, yes, that that is happening. That they are constantly going over the evidence that they have, the information they have, and and looking at it from different angles and asking themselves, "What have I missed?" You know, the sheriff told us that he has the the video on his cell phone and he pulls it up when he's sitting at home to listen to it, to go, what did I miss? Do I know this person? So um, they certainly say that they are using every resource available and um, 
we don't have any evidence to the contrary. All right. Uh, here's our next question from one of our viewers. Have police already identified who the suspect is and are just waiting on one more piece of evidence to secure a conviction? Drew, you get that sense? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, you know, I don't get that sense. I think that they, you know, we have talked to obviously the sheriff of Carroll County, Tob Lesenby, who's mentioned, you know, having a couple of names rolling around in his head. And, you know, the, I think that there may be some thought about some some individuals, but I don't think it's contingent on one piece of, of evidence to come in. I think there is an element of we're waiting on a tip that can push us across the goal line here, whether that tip is, you know, leads to evidence or whatever it is. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Got it. Casey, what could that one piece of evidence be? I really have to believe at this point that they've checked everything having to do with DNA and physical evidence. Um, I don't think they have one particular suspect. I think that it's going to come with a phone call, a tip of somebody who comes in and says, I just remembered that my fill in the blank, brother, uncle, dad, that day was you know absent from work, didn't pick me up from school, fill in the blank. And I think at this point, even though I do believe that it is most like that, likely that the culprit lived or lives in the area, I think they really need to start expanding it out geographically and start looking at neighboring states and, and nationwide. Um, because if it really hasn't pinpointed to somebody in that geographic location, it's really time to expand with a vengeance. Yeah, and Barra, I gotta get your take. You don't think they've narrowed it, do you? Uh, I think like, like Drew, that they've got a, a few names in their head um of people it could possibly be but i don't think it, it's just one person that they're like we just need to get that last tip on this one person and we'll make that arrest um i think what they have isn't that much of a slam dunk yet hopefully that changes soon got it um, it would have happened by now yeah yeah i believe that yeah all right well and this goes along the same vein with this one right actually narrows in on that local community and, and it's a simple question is the suspect local or not drew from all we've seen aren't authorities confident this person's local they are and and you know whether he still lives there or not i think is probably up for some some debate but you know obviously having been out there and knowing the geography and the topography of this area where these girls were found all indications would be that the perpetrator of this crime at least is familiar and knows that area because if you don't know that area frankly, you're not going to really be able to find it. So, you know, I, I do think that they still believe he's local. And worth noting here, Mike, is that, you know, the uh, trail system where the girls were doing their hike that afternoon, it ends at the bridge. So the bridge is not part of the trails. And where we believe the girls were encountered by this perpetrator was the south end of the bridge. So definitely in territory that most of the people using the trails they're not venturing out to that area. And then he took them to an area even more remote and off the trail system onto private property. So he seems to have known the area well and known where he was less likely to be encountering other people. Okay, so give us context, Barb. If you said the south end, that's the far end? Yeah, so the, you know, if, if you're looking at an aerial map of the area, the girls entered the bridge in the northwest corner of that map and walked down to the bridge. We don't know their exact route, but uh, they made it to the bridge and crossed the bridge. They were probably intending to turn around and go back. That's what most people do. We think he might have already been on that south end because it's further away from the trails, less likely to be seen, even in winter when the leaves are off the trees. There's a lot of tree cover in that part of the bridge. And um, we think he knew that was a perfect spot to, to approach. Yeah, and, and Drew, that again, you guys have been there. You, you, you almost would have to be a local to know this area. No kids go there as part of yeah. the thrill of walking across right. the bridge, which would lead to planning this out. Right, in fact, you know, the first time I went there with Barb, Barb had been there once or twice prior. And I was driving and she kind of had to direct us where we were going and even being right there along the road that is where you access the trail, you couldn't see anything. So even when you're right up on the trail, it still looks like you're kind of just out in the middle of rural Indiana. So you really do, it would be, you know, difficult for someone who's not from the area to just randomly pick the spot and know where all these, you know, places are. Yeah. 
Casey, does it say local, planned it, kids go there, I'm going to find my victim on the bridge? Absolutely. But I really want to push the idea that it's somebody who grew up there but has since left and was returning to the area. Um, you know, for this kind of homicide, usually you see uh, this one's relatively um, spontaneous. I don't believe it was planned. Most people don't. But the key is, if, if you didn't go there specifically to plan it, was he revisiting something from his youth, from his childhood? Was there some kind of trigger there? So I just want to really say he, he definitely knew the area, but maybe he had since moved on and was back revisiting for that day. Mm -hmm. On the behavioral front, yeah. is this guy sitting in a, his home in Delphi watching watching our two-part documentary, watching all the coverage, watching law enforcement? You better believe he is. And a lot of people want to speculate and they keep throwing in the whole serial killer theories. I don't think he had killed before, um, but I guarantee you that if we continue to cover this, it will put a huge damper on those fantasies, on that trajectory that could lead to a repeat of that pattern. Um, you know, the fantasy, the abduction and so on. So he's watching and our coverage chills his future thought pattern because as long as we're covering it, he is afraid of getting caught. So that's another reason, apart from catching him, it might, if he's still suffering from those fantasies of, of you know, hurting little girls, we might actually be having a, a role in keeping that from happening. On the power front though, Drew or Barb or both you guys, Authorities almost Doug Carter especially is like playing back and forth with this guy at press conferences, right? Like you're watching, you men, we're going to get you. Yeah, he. You know, we use the phrase uh, in our in our Delphi bureau um, about him engaging in a dialogue with the killer. I mean, there is no doubt that when you watch that New Direction press conference, he is speaking directly to him. I mean, he says it, and so I think. Uh, that on some level they were waiting for a response from the killer, whether it was verbal, a letter, some sort of action or something. Clearly they were, they were starting a dialogue with him. Got it. Barb, way in. When we started the podcast, I remember asking Superintendent Doug Carter, you know, do you feel like this killer has responded to you or, or sought out communication? with you. And at that time, he said he didn't think so. It would be interesting if that dialogue has begun since then. Um, you know, it's not an unusual move for killers of this type to engage in that communication. Um, and certainly the, the police and investigators are ready for it. Yeah. Hey, Barb, I'll stay with you for the next uh, question. Have they sent the DNA they do have to a genealogist? You flat out asked this. So let's, number one, they have DNA, correct? They do have DNA. They have not indicated what type of DNA or whether they have a full profile. Um, the answer I got from the sheriff, Toe Blesenby, Carroll County, um, Indiana, said that uh, they are aware, they have discussed the forensic genealogy, and at this time they have decided to stick with other testing. Yeah, because Casey, we see, okay, you have DNA. It's being tested. We're solving the case. It's not that easy, is it? It's not that easy. And we don't know the state of the DNA, whether the profile, as Barb pointed out, is indeed complete. But by the time they did that, you know, cat and mouse game two years ago with their presser, I'm very sure they had run as much of the DNA as they could on everyone that they suspected. And maybe they were hoping to provoke somebody new that they could pursue. Um, I, I personally wish they would be a little bit more forthcoming about what they're doing with the DNA. I don't think there's a downside to it, but you know, one of the big things that we want to consider is whether or not familial or family tree DNA could be the direction in solving this case, because there've been a number of cases where that's helpful, narrowing down the suspect pool by finding out through um, you know, a big database like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, whether or not there are matches, familial matches in the area. Got it. Uh, next question. Why didn't the girls run when they saw the suspect? So first off, let me say this. I don't think this is the heart of the question. We're not second guessing the girls. They showed incredible courage to get out a phone and get evidence. So let's say that. Um, but Drew, again, we'll lean on your context of the lay sure. of the land. Sure. What, yeah, and we don't know what they went through, but um, what kind of escape route was there potentially? I'm thinking bridge. Right. At the end of the bridge is no well, trail. 
Well, you know, what we don't know is obviously what happened from the point at the south end of the bridge to where the girls were found. Yeah. And so they they very well may have run. In fact, you know, if you think about it, one of the things that led investigators to where they were found was the black Nike shoe that Libby had been wearing that day. So it's entirely plausible that that came off of her foot in some sort of a sprint effort. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we don't know. They may actually have run. The other thing is that, you know, we've talked to both of the families who um, have expressed, you know, their belief that Abby and Libby were very, very close. And it's chilling to think about, but they've both kind of talked about, you know, neither one of these girls would have left the other. So there perhaps was a mutual decision to, we are going to deal with this together. I'm not going to leave you, whether it was Abby or Libby, um, which is chilling to think about. But, you know, so as far as them running, you know, we don't know. They very well may have, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just to ask about it, I think even my emotions begin to stir, you know, when I, when I, Barb, right, when you think of what they went through and the courageous heart of these young girls in, in those moments. And to, you know, obviously they knew something wasn't right as he made his approach. And so to think about them coming to that realization that this is a, a serious issue here that we need to do something about. And they didn't have a lot of options for where to go. They could run, but they're running down a very leaf covered, you know, rough terrain hill um, and across a, a cold creek if, if they did in fact run that distance. Um, they didn't have a lot of options. and. You know, I, I think about even being an adult woman in their position, and I, I think this guy took control very quickly, and they didn't have many options. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that we, we presume that he probably showed or brandished a weapon of some sort. You know, so they're 13, 14 years old, and they've really been taught to obey adults, um, and, and they don't think like we think. So they're probably thinking that if they do whatever he says, they're going to live. So, you know, no, it just wouldn't be the first idea to separate and run. Yeah, watching you in that area uh, near the crime scene, that's some tough terrain. It is, it's very it's difficult to walk. Falling, right? Yeah, and you know, um, it's, it's muddy uh, because it's an area that, that floods um, a lot from the creek and so, uh, and it gets covered in snow and that melts. So depending on the time of year, it can be very muddy there. Um, the terrain is very uneven, even in places where it looks flat, it's very uneven. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think all of that also goes to this man's familiarity with that area to know that that was the place to take them. Yeah. Um, back to the evidence here. Next question. Could police see which phones were pinging on the same tower at the time of the abduction? Again, cell pings. We think, all right, evidence. Drew, not that easy again when you've got a small community and who knows what phone's pinging where. Right. right. I mean, location. yeah, I mean, cell, to cell towers are somewhat ubiquitous at this point. They're pretty much everywhere. So, um, you know, I think the short answer is yes, you can kind of ping those phones off of which towers, but because it's a small community, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person with that phone was right there. I mean, they could have been across town. And so, um, yeah, it's not as simple as just, you know, kind of a, a silver bullet free pass into knowing who is where at all times. Yeah. And Barb, do we know whose phone pinged when and where? We don't. We know that um, Libby was the only one that had a cell phone out there, um, according to family members. Abby didn't have a phone. Um, and so we know that Libby's phone is the one that, that pinged late at night and got law enforcement back out after the official search had been called off um, where they looked for the phone. I don't know exactly when the phone was found. We know that it was found in the same general area as the girls, but that's also a pretty big area. Yeah. Uh, next one. And we could be on this one uh, for a little bit, a lot of, a lot of tentacles to this next one. Uh, have police searched and tried to match the signatures at the scene with other crimes in the area? So Casey, when we talk about the signature, that's like the calling card of a crime. Further define that so we're all on the same page. Sure. So think of this as something that's very specific. I wouldn't argue unique, but very specific to the culprit. And it reflects, we often call it kind of leakage, the inner workings of their brain. 
sometimes we call it a ritual, but I don't like that word because it, it indicates a repetition. And this is the behavioral um, satisfaction, maybe arousal that they're getting that leads them to behave in certain ways before, during, and after the crime. And this can very often be sexual, but sometimes, you know, uh, as something as uh, simple as uh, pulling the shirt over somebody's face because you don't want to see their face would usually indicate uh, somebody who is familiar with the, the victim. But they can become very unique and sometimes so extreme that people are le literally leaving written messages. The police admit that they have two or three things, holdbacks that we don't know about that they would categorize as signatures. Something very specific to that offender that you would see repeated in similar crimes. And I, I the criminologist would obviously love to know what they are, but they're afraid of tainting the um, prosecutability of the case if they let that information out. But you can be sure that they are consulting with uh, criminologists, people from the FBI's behavioral science unit to try to discern what those signatures might mean. And they're certainly looking for them in similar crimes. But if this were the first homicide this perpetrator committed, those signatures are going to be something that emerged during that event. And if he doesn't commit another homicide like this, you won't see them repeated. So they could just be kind of a, you know, a tempest in a teapot and go nowhere. Yeah, because Barb, have they confirmed to you specifically? Yes, there are two or three signatures. Two to three, yes. The, uh, the retired prosecutor, the man who was the prosecutor in Carroll County when this crime happened and for nine months after Robert Ives was the one who told us about it in the podcast and the sheriff confirmed that he agreed that, yeah, that, that does exist at the crime scene, but um, they don't want to release what the details of that are. Um, you know, and I think it's easy for us on the outside to sit and say they should release all of this because we can help solve this. Um, that doesn't make that true that we could help if we had all of this information. And, um, you know, one of the points that that I think gets overlooked sometimes is they really are looking at the long game here of a prosecution and conviction and not just naming a suspect or making an arrest. That's just the beginning. You know, the current prosecutor, Nick McLeland, said when we talked to him that, you know, don't get excited when there's an arrest because that's just an accusation. We haven't proved anything yet. You know, at at the point that we go to trial and get a conviction, then we know who did this. Yeah. Uh, he drew back to the signatures. And sure. what's the hope here that you're comparing the signatures in Delphi with something somewhere else and you get a match, right? Right. I think I think the basic kind of short answer would be the signature would give you the opportunity if this crime or if this offender did something somewhere else, it's an easy match to make. Part of the difficulty with that, though, is getting, you know, getting the information from other from other agencies. And so the, you know, the FBI has uh, as part of their, it's called VICAP, which is the Violent Crime Apprehension Program. And part of that group, they have a database. And that database is designed for every law enforcement agency in the country, local, state, all of them, to basically dump into this bucket all of the unsolved violent crimes that they have. So you, what you can do is then go search that database and type in, you know, double murder with these kinds of elements. And the the theory being, they can run a match and be like, oh, well, something like this occurred in Connecticut, right? Difficulty is, you know, there's there's a, an article in 2015 from ProPublica, which basically said uh, of the 18,000 uh, law enforcement agencies in America, only 1,400 are really using that database. So it's only effective if everybody uses it. Yeah. And Casey, why not? It would seem like this great place for law enforcement to go to compare notes and solve crimes? Well, because you've got to really devote uh, personnel to doing what you would consider the, the typology breakdown, getting all of those variables and feeding them into the database is very labor intensive. And a lot of PDs are just overwhelmed with everyday crime fighting to start with. And unless they have you know, uh, an elevated and educated detective unit that's willing to do the breakdown of those variables and factors and enter them into the database, it's more trouble than it's worth. Um, again, it's only going to help if the person has been arrested before and is in VICAP. Mm -hmm. It's definitely worth looking at. But um, there are other things, If assume, let's assume the perpetrator has never been apprehended for the similar crime. I'm not going to say he's never committed it, but maybe he's not in the database because of that. 
you would want to just come up with variables from known similar crimes that you would look for in your unknown subject or unsub. Um, and, and I don't know enough about um, the signatures to guess, but things that typically show up on this list are you know, consumption of child pornography, um, collection of weapons, those sorts of things. I would really hope law enforcement is looking at those uh, in connection with behavioral analysts to figure out what kind of um, variables they're looking for. Uh, next question. You guys have been talking about it. We'll delve in further. What evidence or type of evidence could police be hiding? And, you know, we've just laid that out there about the signatures. Casey, uh, why not? Why not get that out there? You mentioned it could hurt the prosecution of a case. Explain that to us. They have to have holdbacks. Let's use the word holdback instead of hiding because they want to make sure that when they get the perpetrator, that person um, can tell them things that are unique to that case so they know they have the right person. Remember, if they make an accusation or arrest against somebody who turns out not to be the perpetrator, not only do they ruin that person's life, they, they risk the liability of getting sued. A lot of people probably remember John Mark Carr, a man who came forward and self-confessed to the murder of John Benet Ramsey. Everybody was so excited. And it turned out he was just making it up. He just wanted his 15 minutes in the limelight. They want to discourage anybody from coming forward claiming responsibility for the crimes. Unstable people will do that. And it can absolutely send an investigation down the wrong rabbit hole and waste a lot of time and resources. So yeah. those are the holdbacks. Frankly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote that after four years, they give us a little bit more. I think a little bit more out to the public won't compromise the case could keep us really interested in moving in the right direction. And, and Barb, one of those places would be the phone. If you have more, why not a little bit more? What do they tell you? They're, they're telling us the video is nowhere near as long as a lot of people think it is. People online have speculated it's several minutes, eight, nine minutes long. Uh, the sheriff tells me it, it's not anywhere near that long and that there's nothing else from the suspect on it. He doesn't say any other words on it. And uh, Casey, I think you speculated a, a while back that Libby probably put the phone into her pocket to hide it from him. And, you know, it could be more audio. We do know they are still doing testing on that cell phone to see if there's anything else on it. If there's anything else within that video, they're, they're um, exploring items, I think was the word the sheriff used within that video. Um, but we also, you know, going back to the evidence that we don't know, we don't know the cause of death and we don't know if it's the same for both girls. Uh, we don't know what kind of weapon was used, if one weapon was used or more than one weapon was used and whether they have that weapon. Um, I know a lot of blue jackets have been turned into law enforcement. They tell me they don't have the jacket, but they've had a lot of people turn in blue jackets. Yeah. And Drew, like all the crimes we've covered, usually we know cause of death. That's not a holdback. Right, right. And, and you know, that talk about the questions in this case, that for me is the one that is asked of people ask me that all the time when it comes to this case, what is the cause of death? And, you know, I think like Casey said, there have to be holdbacks. Um, you know, is it because the cause of death has some sort of connection to the signature? I don't know, but if it does, that would be an example of why they would want to hold that back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. That's kind of the million, that's one of the million dollar questions here um, that I think everybody is scratching their head about. Yeah, and Casey, to hold back cause of death, does that surprise you at all? It does. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I don't, I can't imagine circumstances under which letting that out at this juncture would compromise the case. I think it might actually spur new interest in the case and keep things moving forward and tips coming in. If they wanted to let one thing out at this point, I would say cause of death would be really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and again, Barb, you've been to the crime scene. We have no idea how the bodies were left. That's another holdback. No, exactly. We, we don't know. We know that they were uh, near each other in this small area of this private land next to the creek, um, but we don't know exactly how they were left. Uh, we do know that it was obvious to everyone immediately that they had been victims of a homicide. Yeah. Um, Barb, stay with you. Here's a uh... Our 10th question, what about the owner of the land where the bodies were found? What's his status? You made a connection, Barb, clarify for us. Yeah, so he still owns the land, Ron Logan. He's owned it since uh, the 1950s. He raised his family there. He lives there alone. He's got a bunch of animals, goats and a horse. And 
he feeds the birds. He's got a lovely piece of land there. And, um, you know, it's really unfortunate that this happened on his property. We can only assume that he's been looked at really hard. He's never been named a suspect in the case. Um, he's never been charged with anything in connection to the case. So, um, you know, it's, I think, just unfortunate that this happened on his property. Yeah. Um, who are the witnesses that enabled police to create the sketches? That's one like, yes, there have to have been people uh, that were out there. They're not speaking, right, Drew? Right. And, you know, we talk about kind of this being, you know, out in the woods. And I think a lot of times there's a, a feeling that it's, you know, completely isolated and remote. There were people out there. Like you said, there were people walking those trails. Those witnesses have not come forward. You can understand why. There's clearly a killer still on the loose. They are primary witnesses who have enabled these sketches that there's been so much question, so much discussion about. Um, so, you know, we have some kind of vague understanding of who they are, but they haven't come forward and haven't spoken yet. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know when that will happen. It may be a long time, but there is really a tangible fear. I'm sure that they feel, uh, you know, considering this guy is still on the loose. And Barb, any indication that any witness spoke to the suspect? Yeah, we, we understand that one of the witnesses uh, was fairly young, still in high school uh, when this happened, and that um, he may have said a few words to her, um, and she was able to turn around and go in another direction. Um, you know, it's, we don't know how long he was out there looking for his victims. Had he been out there all day? Had he been out there the days prior? You know, this is all stuff that we don't know either from investigators because they don't have that one suspect. Um, we don't know where he came from that day and, and where he, he went to when he was done, um, but he sure has managed to, um, to stay out of sight from people. Yeah, uh, next one. That's not an 18 year old's voice. Why did the sketch age get so low? Barb, is it, did the voice lead to that second sketch and the potential of the suspect being younger? Explain that one. Um, I think that the, the voice by itself is not, there's not enough of it there to give you much information about who the person is or what age they are. Drew did quite a bit of digging into this area. Yeah, I, I, I spoke to a gentleman who early on in our, in our research, who works in audio forensics or used to work in the FBI and audio forensics. And my initial question to him was, you know, what can we glean from this audio? Can we glean age? Can we glean dialect? You know, the way people speak. And, you know, his response to me was essentially, that's not enough. There needs to be more. And so, um, you know, I think that's obviously one of the frustrating parts about this case is we're so close to getting something there, but um, to determine any kind of, you know, makeup of who this person is from the, from just that audio recording, even the experts are like, no, it's, it's pretty difficult. There's not going to be a lot there. Yeah. Casey weigh in on that, the audio forensics we have here. Well, we've all heard it over and over again. And, um, you know, I have my own views on uh, the, the gap in between, hey, guys, you know, blank, 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 go down the hill. And I've, I, I've listened to it hundreds of times, probably. And I think he probably said, you need to go down the hill. And they can't just come right out and say that because it might take everything in the wrong direction. But I honestly do think that the original description of this person is probably more like um, 30 to 45 was where they started. But then as you pointed out, there were some witnesses who did run into him in the area. And the problem is that eyewitness recall can be very biased according to who we are. So let's say a witness says, you know, I did see a guy and maybe he did look like that, but I thought he was more like 18 to 25. They immediately need to just go with that theory and make a sketch that presents that same image, but younger to see if that jogs anybody's memories. They're basically just covering every possible base so that they don't pigeonhole our suspect into a specific age group. And that keeps us considering all options. And it's not a bad thing, except that again, after four years, we really haven't gone in any specific direction. Yeah, and Casey, I know it was pointed out in the, in the documentary that if I'm older than I perceive the suspect to be, then I'm gonna call that suspect 18. Yes, uh, we very much, and, and Apart from the fact that we know old people always undercalculate the age of younger people, 
Um, likewise, younger people can sometimes um, overestimate the age of people who are older than them. But beyond that, little triggers, let's say the guy was wearing a British cap or was wearing like a Carhartt hoodie. We would associate that cap with somebody we know who has a similar cap and align their age with that person or a Carhartt hoodie or you know just a brown hoodie and say that would be a teenage thing to wear or the cap would be an old person's thing to wear. But that's all based on our specific biases of people we know who have those similar characteristics. So you have to take all of it seriously, but also with a grain of salt. And also, I, I wonder if those are even his clothes or if right. those were clothes that he selected to disguise himself that day. So, you know, it doesn't say much about his age based on what he was wearing, I think. Correct. A lot of factors uh, going into that. Uh, next question, guys. Why is this random person walking in the woods? Did he know the girls? Was he truly a complete stranger? Barb. Any indication he knew the girls? before? We don't have any evidence that says that he knew these girls. It is a small town. If he is somebody from the town, as is uh, suspected, it's likely that he or his family knew of the girls or their families, but that doesn't mean that they know each other. Um, I don't believe that, that he knew these girls. Uh, Casey? Yeah, I don't believe it all. I'm sure that after four years, they have really a very exhaustive list of everyone in that area who might be familiar with these girls or the family, and they have gone through it and they've disposed of all of them. But, you know, this whole idea that they're hiding in plain sight, I keep going around with the possibility that somebody who is very familiar with the area may have left and come back on that particular day. So maybe what they need to do instead of looking geographically is look temporally going backwards at people who've lived in that area over the last 20 years. Yeah. And, and we danced around it, Drew. What are you getting from authorities? Did this suspect hang out there all day, maybe days waiting for the opportune moment? Uh, I don't know about days, but, you know, it's funny. It, you mentioned opportunity. You know, I think in, and we've covered a lot of these cases where, you know, we talk about crime of opportunity where the location is set. Uh, you know, maybe the method is set, maybe everything is there except for the actual victims. And they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, it's very possible that this is a scenario that fits under that umbrella. Yeah. Wow. Uh, question 14. Someone knows who he is. They're covering for him. Who would do that? Is it someone else in town? Um, Superintendent Carter, Barb, it's pretty confident somebody knows something, right? And I agree with him on that. I think somebody does know. Um, but, you know, this man did something really horrific to two young girls in broad daylight out in the middle of a public area. And, um, you know, he's dangerous. Um, the person who knows could be scared. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why somebody might not come forward um, and give that information. It's sad. I wish they would. But, you um, you know, they could be scared. And that is something that the investigators have all told us countless times that they can protect the person. The person can remain anonymous and provide the information. And uh, they do have ways of protecting them for coming forward with this information. But, um, you know, this, this person, in my opinion, will probably act again, um, or at least want to. And so he's a threat. And, if for no other reason than that, it's time to come forward. Real quick, Drew, you agree with that? Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to point out that, you know, the question says why they're covering for him. It may not be a situation where they're covering for him, lying for him. It may be a situation where perhaps it's a mother, a sister, a brother who for four years mm -hmm. has not been able to convince themselves that their friend or family member is capable of this. And, you know, who are we to try to figure out how that must feel to try to get there? But like, that's a hard thing to reconcile with. If you think there's someone who might possibly be capable. Great point there. In case I know you want in, what would tick that family member <laughs> over the edge to say, I've got information and they're going to come forward. Drew nailed it. And I've actually done extensive research on what I call the pall of denial. It stemmed from a serial killer who had six bodies in his house and his, in which he lived with his family and they never knew. And people are like, of course, how could they not know? And uh, you know, they were in the attic, they were in the basement. If you climbed the stairs or went down to the basement, you would know, but they just didn't go there. The brain is an amazing thing in the interest of self-preservation. When it's information that they know they can't handle, they just don't go there. 
So the polyp denial is literally like a, a steel gate that kind of closes on the brain and death doesn't go down the path that could lead them to realize my nephew, my uncle, my son, my husband might be this culprit because deep, deep inside the subconscious is extremely complex. They won't be able to handle that truth. What will that mean about them? What will it mean about you know, having to turn this person in? So very often something has to actually trip that brain and it's usually, it's a trigger that makes everything kind of slam into their heads and go, I have to say what I know, but who knows what's going to do that. Maybe the information hasn't reached them yet. Maybe, um, you know, something new will come forward that will literally just bring the truth slamming into their head and the pall of denial would be crashed. That's why we have to keep talking about it. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Incredible perspective there. Hey guys, last question. Barbara, I'll throw this one to you. What about Derek, Carrie's ex-husband? And Derek is uh, Kelsey and Libby's father, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's right. And um, Kelsey- and him, Was he ever a suspect? Tell us about it. Uh, well, we know that, that all of the family members have been checked out. And the word that the sheriff uses is they are covered. Doesn't mean that they're cleared. Nobody technically is cleared in this investigation thus far. Uh, but Derek was supposed to pick the girls up from the trails that day. He got out and did some searching. He's the one that called all the family members, alerted everyone and got the official search going. Um, we know family members have given DNA, have been interviewed. Um, so we can only assume that, that he's been checked out as well. He is somebody who does not want to tell his story publicly. He does not talk. And uh, that's from what we understand, just the kind of person he is. Got it. Well, we've hit a lot, you guys. Man, it seems like five minutes. Um, I'll give each of you a chance, just some final thoughts as we wrap up. We're keeping this story out there and we're hoping and praying for a break and justice for these precious girls. But Barb, your, just your thoughts as you um, have done such incredible work on this. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, Abby and Libby were just um, regular girls out having a good time. They were good girls. They weren't doing anything wrong and they didn't deserve what happened to them. Um, and I, I certainly hope that if somebody is listening to this and knows that they'll be motivated to, to send in that tip, don't post information like that on the internet. A lot of people do, um, send it to law enforcement. There's a lot of different ways that you can get that information to law enforcement and that's where it should go. Yeah. Well said. Drew. Um, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with Mike Patty uh, over the course of working on this story. And I always think of one that jumps out at me is, you know, a year and a half ago or so we were at their house. Uh, they were having a cookout and we, he and I were in the garage. Uh, and he said to me unprompted, we were just kind of chatting and he said, Drew, we had plans, meaning he and Becky, uh, his wife, we had plans before all this for retirement, uh, cashing in a 401k, sending the girls off to college. Me and Becky were going to go right across the country with an RV. Um, you know, he had, they, were, they had a whole plan moving forward. And uh, he's like, that's all, that's all gone now. Left turn, completely gone. And so the reason I bring that up is because I think we oftentimes forget, you know, as we talk about these forensics and all the science and stuff, but like we forget kind of the human element here sometimes. And I think we should remember that. Yeah, mm -hmm. well said. And I think the documentary really brought heart um, to the story as well. Casey, uh, final thoughts? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb and appeal to law enforcement to trust that our interest is so sincere that they kind of need to throw us a bone. And going back to the pall of denial, I do believe someone out there does know something, but they don't know they know it. And if they could just give us something more, like cause of death, uh, a little bit more evidence, the whole video, so that people, because they say there's just not much more to it, so why don't you give it to us? I think that the trigger that we just talked about that could get someone who knows something to have that crashing moment and make that phone call, you put that tip into the police, it could happen if they just gave us a little bit more. I think they should sit down, figure out what they can give away safely and keep our interest peaked by trying to send that trigger out there. Yeah, and that's what we are hoping for. That's what we're really pushing for. And we know you as well as a viewer with an interest in this case, that break that will lead to an arrest that will lead to justice uh, for Abby and Libby. It's great to see you guys. Casey, Drew, Barb, keep up the good work. And you know it, if something breaks in this case, tune to HLN. We're going to have it. Drew and Barb will be uh, front and center. They've got their uh, hands on the pulse beat of the folks there in Delphi. Great to see everybody. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks.